All right, today we're going to be as crusty as we could possibly be. We're going to be contrarian. We're going to complain about things that you're otherwise being told are the best practices in software architecture, which they may actually be. We're not going that badly. Uh, so today, just quickly a little bit. Uh, first, before we, we get later into this and you're wondering, who am I to question some of, some of this wisdom coming down from on high from the Uncle Bobs of, of, of the past? Um, so I'm Jeremy Miller. This is my third time, third time speaking at NDC. Uh, Woodwood here in 2020 to finally, finally meet Oscar, but the world had other ideas in 2020. Um, I'm a longtime open source developer in, inside of .NET. Um, specifically, I want to call out Structure Map. Not that it's an exciting project. Uh, Structure Map was the first production-ready IOC container in .NET. So. In about 30 minutes, when some of you are shaking your head saying, this guy clearly does not understand dependency inversion, I, I, I do, cut me a little slack. Um, that's going to come up a little bit, just, just my experience have also having to help other people through using some of these tools. Um, in my daily work today, for the moment, I am the um, Senior Director of Software Architecture at Medi Analytics. That's a medical analytics software company uh, in the US and Ukraine. Um, in the next week or two, I'm going to be transferring, um, starting my own company called Jasper FX Software, and that is going to be all about services and product offerings on top of some other open source tools, the, the Critter Stack, Wolverine and Martin. This talk is not about those things, but some of the work we're doing with those tools is definitely informed by our experiences working with, with big, long-running architectural um, long-running enterprise systems, and I want to show you some of the ideas that we're trying out to, to kind of go off in a little bit different direction, but that's later. All right. So, the <clears throat> last, last five to ten years, uh, through consulting gigs, working in product companies, um, wherever it's in, working with um, large companies, smaller product shops that have nevertheless built very large systems, uh, and even working with with some charitable foundation work. Um, consistently seeing some trends across very large, very long running systems. And we're talking about systems that have been in very active production for five to 10 years, um, where the problems start to happen. The code has been very hard to follow, to reason about. Uh, one of the systems I'm, I'm helping with right now, it's very difficult to predict that hey, if we go into this one place, if we cut if-then statements and do a little bit of conditional logic here for this one specific customer off the side, does it end up shattering the business logic for a bunch of other customers down the line? It's just very hard for us to know. The call stacks are big. The consequences are not really clear. That's a problem. Some of these code bases are very high friction. Um, code becomes scattered all over. Closely related code becomes scattered all over a very large solution. Uh, the things that you care about at that very moment are not necessarily right together in one nice, tidy little package. That's a problem. Upgrades. Upgrades are very hard. Uh, just pulling something, something out as an example, we have a very, very large system at work that uses in Hibernate. Um, once upon a time, I think I was part of the in Hibernate Mafia, even though I hated that name, um, and heavily invested that in as a tool, but it's had its day. It's, it's aluminum wiring. Not as many people understand it today. Our younger developers, which means everybody but me now, um, <laughs> our younger developers are not familiar with it. EF Core, Dapper, other tools, vastly more Googleable. That's a quality all by itself. We'd kind of like to get... We kind of like to mosey on from in Hibernate, but in our giant monolith application, nah, -uh, too big, can't do it. Performance is a problem, um, not necessarily because people are starting out to write slow code, but when these systems get big, and, and I think it's especially around the databases, it's hard to understand where are we making network hops, where are we making sequential database calls. Where deep in this call stack are we making even similar calls to the database, but we can't really see it because the code is too spread out. Performance problems creep in really badly when the code just gets big and you can't see it anymore. Now, all of these systems were written by people who cared about their jobs. All of these people, they had a plan. They started out with a well-defined architecture 
they were they were coming to conferences like in DC. They were going to the workshops on clean architecture, onion architecture, whatever it's going to be. But the problem is, <coughs> everything works up front. So that's Mike Tyson. Uh, originally, uh, I, I was going to do like a Elmer Fudd getting knocked out, and I went for the meaner one too. So Mike Tyson's quote years and years ago. He had some high-profile fight coming up when, when people still paid attention to boxing. And they were asking him, hey, uh, Michael Spinks says he has a plan on how to beat you. Or maybe it was Evander Holyfield. I don't know. And he says, hey, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right? Software architecture, everything works at first. Whatever you pick is probably going to work absolutely fine in the early stages of a project. That's when you're paying attention to things the most. So you're going to find problems and, and alleviate problems. That's when the, the use cases are simpler. So potential frictions aren't necessarily showing up yet. So you got to be careful. This, this project plan we started with, this architectural idea, it's great right now. All of the absolute worst systems I've seen in my life has been from somebody purposely, consciously, professionally picking an architectural plan and following it, but following it even when it stopped working. All right. So um, any, any other Generation X programmers in the room? I, I'll, okay, just a few hands. So I originally did a, did a version of this, this talk for my 19-year-old son, and I was going to try to use the, the Lannis Morris said, isn't it ironic? You know, so the 10 of you now have that, that song just buried in your mind for the rest of the day. But my son had no earthly idea what that was. So instead, I went for the classic 90s movie, right? <laughs> so, I, but ironically, uh, the, some of the elements that I think have led to these big systems being hard to work with are exactly the kind of things that we are told that we maybe we believe are exactly what you use to make these systems be maintainable. Hexagonal architectures, clean architecture, um, the onion architecture. And then I admittedly, I have a special hatred for the onion architecture. But th this is somewhat personal. Um, that leads people to trying to do unusually complicated things with IOC tools, which means they usually end up on my doorstep asking for help. Um, so it's a little bit of bitterness. There's an older, older form, another prescriptive architecture called iDesign. Uh, that is all about how do you divide responsibilities in an architecture, um, where do you put service boundaries. It's a prescriptive architecture. It has a lot of good stuff with it, but it can lead to a very overcomplicated system that's slow. <clears throat> Database abstractions. We'll, we'll hammer on this a little bit later. You know, we, we know, we think we want to abstract the database a little bit, maybe for testability, maybe we think we swap the database out layer. later, maybe that's so, maybe it's not. But what database abstractions can do is it reduces your database technology to a least common denominator approach. Um, it also, I think, gives developers an incentive to go down to pulling out a single entity at a time, um, and it's going to make you chatty and potentially make you very, very slow. We'll get into that. Anti-corruption layers. You know, we know that in some cases we don't want to share our rich domain model entities over a web service. So we'll put some kind of mapping layer in there specifically to not share types. Go too far with that. Um, that's why iDesign shows up. Go too far with that, and what you do is you add a lot more mental overhead to understand the system. How many jumps does any data element in the system go through mapping layer to service layer to mediator to a command over here. Everything you do for the sake of loose coupling also comes with a little bit of cost of just extra junk to tra keep track of. And then finally, um, we're definitely going to talk about prescriptive coding structures. And here what I mean is um, one of the early days of, of my current position, I was asked, hey, Jeremy, can you put together a reference architecture? a reference template for what microservices or services are going to be. And, and I, partially out of laziness, somewhat out of, hey, that's actually kind of dangerous. 
Um, when you set up a detailed reference architecture, and we'll get into this a little more, the, the key risk there is people will actually follow it. <laughs> All right. So I think it's probably going to come out that I'm going to bash on the clean architecture, the, the onion architecture, the what all these prescriptive architectures are. The things that you've probably already gone to workshops for today. Ian Cooper has a great talk on clean, clean architecture. Um, I want to be a little bit more nuanced here. These aren't necessarily horrible things by themselves, but there's some bad that can creep in with them. So we'll go to this old folk saying, which again, my 19-year-old had never heard of. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The elements of good design that the clean architecture gives us, we want to keep that. The problems that it, that it will incur in large systems, let's try to throw that out with the bathwater. Right. So just, just kind of getting a, kind of a general sense, make sure we're all together on what we mean here by a layered architecture. And here I'm talking about the whole category of hexagonal architectures, anything any architectural style, clean, uh, hexagonal itself, uh, ports and adapters, the onion architecture, anything that tries to make you think in terms of technical layers or layers of responsibility, uh, that's what I mean here. Uh, these architectural styles are great. They promote the idea of separation of concerns. Uh, the idea that I want to get my infrastructure out of my business logic. That's going to be very important. I think that's very important. Um, they give you predictable rules. Developers don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time thinking about where should this code go. Just follow the rules and the code goes where it goes. Whether that's a good idea in the end is, is not as black and white as the rules say. All right. This all sounds great. Tons of, tons of work. Shops, people doing plural site videos. A lot of you are probably having success with this today, and I don't want to take that away from you. Um, I think in limited perspectives, we have had success in my own work. But this comes with some problems. When these things go off the rails, I'll switch to code. This is a little bit contrived, um, except what's not contrived is it's absolutely real. So what you see in one of these large systems. <clears throat> yeah, this is .net, admittedly .NET centric, but we end up with <clears throat> having a separate project, a jar, an assembly, for every technical stereotype of the system. Um, when you start out small, that's no big deal. You have your domain, you have entities in one place, down to another one, there's infrastructure. I copied this from somewhere, so it's not as be. It's a junk drawer, lots of base types. Uh, the entities, what happens when there's 100 different classes in your entities folder, which I've seen um, multiple occasions. You get to a point where finding the code that you want at any one time, um, hopefully you're good with your IDE shortcuts. You know, got to do that no matter what. But closely related code, making changes in the system, making a simple change of, hey, this customer has this extra data element, or maybe they, their workflow is a little bit special. Our, our customers, God love them, uh, they just kill us with exception cases, right? Um, when we have to go and change one of these systems built on this kind of layered architecture approach, you end up doing shotgun surgery. Write a little bit of code up here, come and write a little bit of change way down here, another change way down there. When you're writing it, you get the boiling frog problem. You don't notice this at first when you're just dropping a few new classes in. This adds up when you get really late 10 years later, five to 10 years later. I despise this kind of layered architecture. If you've seen me on Twitter gripe about clean or onion or whatever it is, it, it, it's this. This needs to go away. <clears throat> There's a couple other problems that show up we'll get into just a second later. So, Already talking about how to ameliorate this a little bit. Um, and this talk in a, this point in a talk, I always make some kind of joke. I'm a real developer, and that's why I'm not super great with PowerPoint, and I'm always awkward with this stuff. 
oh, I reordered it. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> I thought I reordered it. So one of the ways to ameliorate this. So those layers, we were off the rails. When those, those layers become very huge, um, part of the research I was doing to get ready for this talk, make sure I did an okay job uh, while my flight delays kept piling up today, um, one of the things the proponents of clean architecture will talk about is, well, you can upgrade, you can easily upgrade uh, your application or you can switch database engines, right? Um, everybody's, everybody's heard that at some point. And if you've got a good abstraction, right, and you switch databases, no, not really. In reality, in reality, if you have a large enough horizontal layer, you are not able to pract as practically upgrade because it's just too much regression testing no matter what. Even if you've got the best abstraction in the world, which you don't, because databases are actually different, um, we just don't have the time. We can't tell product owners we can we just can't take on upgrading that whole horizontal staff horizontal spread all at one time. It's just not practical. Instead, it's just a mild change. Um, a lot of the issues, my whining with with layered architectures can be ameliorated by uh, what folks could now call vertical slice architecture. Just the idea that I am going to organize first by cohesive features within the system. Uh, a bit of functionality. And I'm trying to show this here. I'm showing separate databases. It doesn't necessarily mean you're automatically having a giant modular monolith that's targeting six, eight totally different databases. Just that if a segment of the database, whether it's a schema, a set of collections, if at least between features could be a little bit loosely coupled from each other, that even if you're a monolith, if you could do upgrades this at a time, one feature at a time, that's practical. You can convince product owners of, hey, we can do this upgrade. In our case, it's, it's not necessarily an upgrade. It's cheap, right? We, we kind of like to replace SQL Server with Postgres in some of our big systems, just purely cost savings. It would be nice if we could do that. If we could tackle it more bitwise, a sprint by sprint, we could deliver in a sprint, we could deliver switching part of the app from SQL Server to Postgres, but there's no way in hell within one sprint we could ever do the whole, whole horizontal layer. That's something to think about. Other weakness, layered architecture, they talk about, well, you can reason about one layer at a time. You never reason about one layer at a time. You reason about one use case at a time, the full vertical stack. Hopefully you can concentrate on only the business logic or only the data access logic, but likely when you have customer problems, when you have integration tests fa failing, you need to trace tightly related code from entry point to controller level to data access layer to service level to entity, the tightly related code. Put it together, keep it as close together in your code as you possibly can. That means you're gonna lose out on some of that, that rigor that people try to do through project references. Um, people try to force this kind of loose coupling rule by setting all those kind of rules of, you know, this project can only access that project and can only have these tech and all that. That's great. Um, it's extra overhead. It's extra friction on you. Um, it's just better if developers can be disciplined instead. I'm gonna keep harping on, keep harping on layered architecture just a little bit. So now you start talking about advice, right? Your reference architecture. So you'll download, people have these things all over GitHub. Here's what a microservice would look like. And I'm gonna have a controller that calls to a mediator level, that calls to a service layer, that calls to a repository abstraction that's hopefully persisting entities and talk to the real database. That consistency is great, except what happens in reality. Um, sometimes it just flat out doesn't work. Sometimes it's unnecessary complexity. You see shallow passers. Everybody's probably seen this in their code, right? Following a template, you see nothing but a service layer that just immediately delegates to the next layer down. That's silly. Um, I think a much bigger problem is when these things become way too bloated. 
So we switched to code just one quick second here. The other killer problems, um, I'm always kind of kind of lame. Um, let's say our problem problem is an invoice. So a really common practice is to try to organize these controllers and repositories and entities around really CRUD-centric thinking, saying that let's have a folder or let's have an invoice controller, which means we're going to have an invoice, invoice service and invoice um, repository, so on and so forth, right? And this is all spread out all over the system. But what happens longer term, um, you get a lot more operations than just CRUD as this grows. Um, I've seen it, plenty of cases where these controllers can have 10 to 15 different operations. So you end up with controllers that just have massive dependency lists because you have all these interrelated endpoints that everything that touches an invoice or an order or whatever your entity is, you're going to have one big method here that calls one big method here, calls one big method here, so on and so forth. Um, that gives developers a disincentive to think about what else should be there. As use cases grow much, much larger, um, by having one method, one calling one method, one method, one method, one method, um, it's a disincentive to start extracting methods out because you really have a junk drawer of unrelated operations that just loosely follow under the aegis of, of an entity. So developers, I'm sure some of you have seen this, developers will bloat these things like crazy because that's all the template says to do. Right? What they need to do instead is they need to be breaking out of the template. They need to realize, hey, in this case, that template no longer works. We're going to come back to the organization by entity because I think that's that kind of CRUD-centric thinking uh, based on nouns. I think that's actually a, a root cause of a lot of the bloated problems in these kind of big systems. But first... Let's contemplate uh, Winnie the Pooh for just a second. Okay. While I get a drink. So, out of this this whole whole talk, if there's one and only one thing I want you to take away from this, um, most of us here are probably technical leaders within our within our organization, or or you certainly aspire to be. Fair statement, folks. Right. Some of you probably learned this lesson. The first time out, I was a technical lead. Or sec first time I was a technical lead, I just did all the coding and had the other people do nothing. The second time when I actually tried to be a tech lead, um, I learned a horrible lesson. Um, I tried to write out in great detail because I was getting yelled at so much for not giving enough guidance. So I wrote down this really detailed guidance of how to do a coding task and handed it off to the developer. And when I got the code back, it was horrible. What was horrible about it? I had given him the wrong advice, and he had just followed what I did. He didn't think it, he didn't question it, didn't change, just did what I told him to. <laughs> the, the hard lesson I learned is, when you're giving technical advice, technical direction, it's much more important to explain the why. Why are we using this template? When is it applicable? And also creating a decision tree of when does this not work so that th this advice that I gave you thinking about these three use cases, when you hit use case four, that's something totally different, you have some tools to know of, hey, this is wrong. This, this doesn't apply. I should do something different. Trying to avoid that problem with bloated controllers, bloated service, service layers. All right. Now, there's a balance here. We do these prescriptive approaches so developers don't have to think. Right? They just proceed and do. Problem is, it doesn't work. It just doesn't give you good results in harder, harder systems. So technical lead, always got to be explaining why are we doing things, understanding, trying to explain the rationale, and always give the other developers space to challenge what, what we're doing, and always have a little bit of room to innovate when they hit into something different or at the very least, your very most junior developer should at least be comfortable coming back to you and saying, hey, this just doesn't seem to work. Um, what do you think? At least getting that kind of negative feedback of, hey, this reference architecture, it ain't working for me.
So um, going for more Gen X, um, this is even a little before my time, you know. So we're criticizing a lot of things. We're going to criticize more database abstractions in a minute. But what is good? Conan, what is best in life, right? Um, I'm, what I'm going to say, it's not necessarily the stuffy rules, who can call what, project structures, reference architectures. It, it can be helpful, but that stuff's... Um, at all times, you want to keep very closely related code together as close as you can. You want to be able to work at the speed that you can think. I want to even be able to, to and we'll show a sample in a minute. I want to be able to just put, put controllers that call services that call mediators. I want to put it in the same file while I'm working on it from the beginning. It's real easy that way. I can just scroll up and down. I can think all the time. I don't have to distract myself with remembering this goes in this folder and this one goes there. Um, the single biggest thing, uh, what I would say, the single most guaranteed and reliable way to get to quality in any code base, it, it's iteration and adaptation. It, it's, that is the only perfectly reliable way to ever get to something good. So you want to purposely choose to work in a way that makes iteration and adaptation possible and easier. So having effective test automation coverage I think is actually more important than the rules about layering and abstractions and all that kind of thing. That gives you reversibility. This gives you the ultimate ability to change, make the code soft and change the code. And when I say effective here, I mean it's fast. You can run it locally anytime you want. Um, obviously, I'm griping a little bit about Selenium uh, suites here. Um, it's fast, it's reliable, you can count on it. It's relatively comprehensive. Again, going down that theme of iteration, I want to use lower ceremony code. Um, and what I think there is um, an example I'm thinking of in our system. We, it's a good thing. We adopted open telemetry very early on, uh, but we've adopted it much earlier than our messaging bus frameworks had it. So we're manually writing open telemetry tracing calls in every single message handler in some cases, right? That's not hard code, but it's ceremony and it's bloat. Now, we hit cases where we're finding message handlers that really need to be broken up for various reasons. Um, actually, in this case, it's trying to open a connection, make an external web service call, come back, and finish a transaction out. It's horrible on your database. We want to break this up and be doing multiple calls. But to break up those message handlers, we have to recreate all that open telemetry tracing. That's extra ceremony. But instead, you know, as we move into newer tools or just upgrade the tools we have, if you don't have to manually do the, those extra explicit steps, it's cheaper. It's lower cost for you to change, change your message handlers, break them up. Dropping down to the bottom, we've covered some of this. Um, we're about to go into database, database right now. So what I'm going to tell you is I think the absolute most important thing for business logic is to keep infrastructure concerns out of your business logic. I didn't necessarily say abstract the database. That may be the answer, but the single best thing you can is keeping all technical concerns out of business logic or workflow logic. And we'll look at some other approaches. That doesn't automatically mean database abstraction, but that, that's important. Okay. Um, and then something to soften this up. Again, with these stuffy rules of you got to build an adapter interface so that you can swap out the database or stick an in-memory database in, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is something, something I think has been a big change in the last five, 10 years, is we're starting to have more and more technologies where it's actually relatively easy to incorporate them as integration tests. Um, and if your technology is easier to easy in integration tests, I'm not going to worry so much about pulling layers and adapters and in-memory stuff. I'm just going to code through the, the real stuff. And as long as my testing is good and fast, I'm happy with it. Okay. Abstracting the database. Is it a good idea? Is it not? Um, and and it's, it's it depends. It's always it depends. Let me switch to code. Did you make it a bit bigger? Well, I'll make the code really big. Oh, the font here? No, it's more, if you're not in presentation mode, it's... 
Oh, yeah, hold on. Like I said, I'm always awkward with this stuff, man. <clears throat> you heard my bad joke of the, the, the people who are really good with AV, it's because they don't code. It's obviously not true. <laughs> All right, so th this kind of, this kind of I repository of T, um, I, I don't know how common this really is anymore. It, it was really common a decade ago. It, I see it pop up. Um, I think this is really problematic in the end. I think this causes more harm than good, especially with a bigger, more complicated system. This is a very close reflection of exactly what the underlying technology does. Um, it just doesn't add a lot of value. It's, it's pretty well close to a straight up pass through. Uh, and then, you all have, so let me, and also, again, go back to this idea of CRUD. Um, trying to organize code around entities, it's not really how it works in the real world. Um, it's just very common. You're going to hit operations where you're crossing into different CRUD boundaries. You're, you're using different entities. And, you know, here I'm, I'm making up. You're touching a user. You're touching an order. You're touching an invoice at the same time. And now I need to have a transaction boundary around all of these. And, and you have to get those transaction boundaries right. You cannot screw that up or your system's going to be really bad. Um, so now you might start adding more unit of work abstractions. So you get these, these really bloated controllers where they just pull in so many different dependencies because they need a separate repository for whatever it is. The underlying persistence tech probably, probably would happily let you use one thing. Okay? We just try to make the point here. So here's a version of invoice repository to just do basic CRUD operations. And in this case, um, I use Martin because I wanted to. Um, it, it's mostly just just pass through, except right off the bat. This is common. I'm committing transactions in here directly. Um, so right there, you're kind of losing your ability to do transaction boundaries between multiple operations, which absolutely happens. See that as easily. Um, more problems with this kind of kind of repository. So. Performance issues, one of the very common causes of performance issues, it's database chattiness. Um, these kind of database abstractions, like, oh, you can swap out Dapper for, for in Hibernate or EF Core. Um, it forces you into lowest common denominators. You're not using the power of a system. So here I want to jump into something real quick. Just going to require me to remember where I put it. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Okay. Oh, and then I immediately threw it away. Last conference I did, uh, they would not let you do live coding. Uh, they made this big thing of you're not allowed to do it. Everything you have to have like every code sample saved to a static file because we just flat out don't trust you. <laughs> so this is using a little bit of Martin, a little bit of Martin. But the, well, let me explain what what Martin because again this isn't a Martin talk. Um, let's say that we have an operation where uh, we're this is a banking application I'll use in a little bit. Um, at one time, we need to get both a user's bank account and some customer information. So we can get, pick off things like email preferences, whatever that is. So we need two pieces of closely related data. Uh, with the database, I'm using a little bit of, of barely advanced Martin functionality to go grab these two related documents in one database round trip. Right? Anything you can do generally with databases to avoid database round trips, to batch up queries, to grab data at one time, to avoid doing sequential calls, right? That's, that's going to be a performance boost. Or flipping that around the other way, 
n plus one query problems where you query a bunch of data and then you loop through the data to go do other queries, that's a pretty common performance problem. So I'm using right here, just the point is, I'm using some Martin functionality that's specific to Martin that really doesn't necessarily fit inside of that, that very thin, what I call prophylactic abstraction. You know, the iBase repository, it, it only lets you work on one entity at a time. There's no concept of batching queries or, or getting included, included things. Um, looking at other problems, again, trying to use the power of your system. Um, and, and to some degree, this is, this is a little bit based on me having a lot of investment in building developer tools. Because um, it's obviously a frustration when you try to build a really good tool and then somebody puts a bad abstraction around it that throws away most of the power. Um, look at the code that's highlighted. No, 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 this is .NET centric. Um, let me, me kind of talk about this. Directly expose, exposing iQueryable, uh, that is, is the programmatic uh, strong type, type querying language inside of .NET. Various tools have very different dialects and support for for iQueryable. Um, even if you're trying to do it with in-memory approach, I've been burned very badly when an in-memory approach behaves very, very differently from, uh, in that case back then it was using RavenDB, where we weren't using RavenDB indexing in an intelligent way whatsoever because it was behind uh, a naive abstraction. You gotta watch out for that. That's a world of trouble trying to abstract away iQueryable behind an i repository. But folks still do it. Okay. Let me get it back here. So just kind of review. Do you abstract the database or not? Um, I don't think I would even bother. It, the things that are simple, add, delete, save changes, I personally wouldn't, wouldn't bother. It's just not that hard to do find and replace if you want to swap your tooling. But more importantly, if we are breaking our system into modules where it's easier to upgrade one module at a time. I don't think we need so much of that overhead of, of the database abstractions. That's, that's my thinking about it. Uh, we'll get into testing in a sec too. All right, um, integration test. Talk's going faster than I thought it would. All right, one of my claims One of my claims is that if you just use tools that are actually quite nice to use in integration testing, eh, not so worried about, about coupling. So Martin. Uh, Martin is a library that lets you use Postgres as a document database on top of Postgres. Document databases are kind of awesome. There's no ORM mapping. Database is a JSON serialized version of your data. Your data can be, can have rich, types, it can be nested objects, it can have collections, it can be all kinds of things, it doesn't really matter, as long as it's serializable, there's very low friction in putting it together, all right? So in tests, let's say, uh, let, me, let me look at the actual handler here. I'm gonna build a message handler. Um, I wanna, want to show this message handler. Okay, um, message handler for withdrawing funds from a bank account. A little bit of logic, you know, we need to go look up what the current account is. We need to, we're gonna execute a, a command. <clears throat> I'm gonna use Martin to save data, which eventually is all it's here. So a little bit of branching logic. Um, if the balance is lo lower than account's minimal threshold, then we're gonna raise another event. Low balance detection. Um, you know, for me having a college age, college age son, you know, hey, he, his bank account's way too low because he's going out to eat way too much, right? Um, that kind of thing. So I want to test this this logic and certainly have that this is in a point where it can be unit tested. We'll see just pure pure integration. So using tooling that is first 
um, integration test friendly. So this one's a big thing. Um, who's using Docker for local dependencies and develop, uh, development time? Yeah, that's quite a few hands. So I think that's. I think that's been like one of the best things in the last 10 years, being able to spin up databases, RabbitMQ, little things, just on the fly, being able to trash them, stand them up, whatever it's going to be. That's very developer friendly. That's integration test friendly. In the case of Martin, that, that's all I've done here is I've just spun up a little Postgres container. Um, without doing anything else, um, let's, let's look, jump into a quick little bit of a test harness. Um, the some X unit mechanics. X unit, I think, is a little awkward for integration. Um, this is uh, this is effectively using um, web web host builder. This is just spinning up the actual application, spinning up a, an iHost, um, using some other tools here, um, doing a little bit of Wolverine stuff. And Martin has a feature specifically for integration testing where I can just say. If I need some reference data for testing, I can just kind of establish a baseline set. You always need that kind of thing. Um, just here, just so that when we spin this up and test completely from scratch, Martin can fill itself with baseline reference data so you can go to, go to, go to town and start working. All right, so a shared app fixture that's just standing up our application. It's running the iHost exactly the way it is. It's running our program, program.main. That's how I personally like to do integration testing. Just take the normal application, a little bit of stand up. It's got Martin in it, it's got Wolverine. Um, stand that up in tests so you're using the IOC container built exactly the way right? Just some little extra stuff. <clears throat> the test itself, um, building the test harness uh, to have a clean database per, you know, this does cut our ability to, to parallelize tests, but just go with it for now. Every test, uh, for automated tests to work, you have known input state. So if it's easy in this case, because it's built into Martin, if it's really easy to tear down a database set and reset it to exactly a known state, your tests are more reliable. Way more reliable than depending on external scripts to set a database up. So now, um, let's do a little. So now you can finally have a real integration test where um, I set up, well, if I have an account, and I'm going to go write that to the database, so it's already there. Now, again, this is a little more helping functions around Wolverine and Martin. This is its test automation to say, all right, I'm going to go invoke this message. I'm going to wait for all activity to be done. So if it spawns extra work, wait and finish it. And then finally, I can go, I can go kind of check. Well, I'm just going to go load the database and see what database changes were made. You know, still more work than unit testing, but not a huge amount. And then I can even track... Um, hey, I rigged this up. Um, yeah, we could. <laughs> we could have checked to see if it sent the uh, low balance detected message as necessary. Okay. All my point there, besides sneaking in a little bit of cell job on Martin Wolverine, just point there, whether it's microservices or something else, if we can pick technology that plays nicely in integration tests, you can go with a much simpler approach. You can use you can just use straight up procedural coding as long as it's understandable. So that's integration testing. Now we talked quite a bit about keeping infrastructure out of out of the database, or excuse me, keeping database out of your business logic. The go-to move is to wrap 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 abstractions around the database so you can mock it, you can stub it. That, that is an approach that may be what you want to do. But the biggest thing is, um, I like what Jim Shore describes as the A-frame architecture. Uh, let me just kind of kind of show an example here. We're going to go to Wolverine. So this withdraw funds handler. 
This is the message handler here. Um, this is this is Wolverine. Wolverine's trying to embrace this whole idea of A-frame. Um, when we are running this, the whole process, it, it's actually a compound. First, um, I'm going to go having an incoming command. I'm going to go look up the necessary data, which in this case, maybe it's just the account data. I'm going to go get the account data, and I'm going to push that into the actual message handler. It's not exactly there, but you want to put, get to the point where the message handler, the place where it's business logic, you want to try to make that a pure function. Here's some inputs. Tell me what your outputs are, which case is uh, mutating the account and then also returning, hey, these are the next steps I need you to do. Um, being able to test this, the business logic by Mostly, it's not perfect yet because we've still got an iDocument session abstraction there, but mostly being able to push, hey, if you have this account and this command, what are the responses that you send back out and how do you modify the account? Um, taking this a little bit farther, hopefully in a month or two, there'll be an example of this that doesn't have iDocument session in there. Um, being able to accomplish the same thing, when, when Jim says A-frame, what he means is, there is some kind of coordinator up top that's talking to both service providers, which would be maybe your database, and your business logic. The controller up top is invoking, as necessary, it's invoking the infrastructure, getting all the data that is necessary for the business logic, and then pushing it to the business logic, gathering the results from the business logic, and then pushing it back at the infrastructure to make the changes. That's just a separation of responsibilities it doesn't automatically imply that you have to have abstractions, but still keep the business logic away from your database stuff. So <clears throat> the approach you're trying to take with, with Wolverine, um, actually, to make it more fun, there's also the ability to do this with middleware. Um, trying to build that that whole idea of A-frame architecture completely inside of the message handling framework itself. So it's doing much more work to push data to you. It's invoking the data and then doing the push, trying to drive, again, to the, the goal of getting very low ceremony code. Um, the theory is, when this stuff is a little bit better, we maybe eschew some of the more complicated code format layouts. I'm not going to worry about having separate projects for data access, this or that. I may even embed functionality that is specific to a command. I may put the, the data access itself directly into the message handler, but as a separate function that can be called separately. All right? This is a theory. This is the part where I'm going to start losing people. Um, but this is, this is the, maybe an alternative approach I am interested in exploring over the next couple of years. Um, again, it's back to the theory, keep closely related code together, try to enable your developers to make changes in isolation. Um, just think about this, we, we're using Bitbucket at work, a lot of you are using GitHub. When you're reviewing a pull request, is it easier when there's a few files changes or is it a little harder to review when you get the shotgun surgery thing where there's a couple lines of code changing in 20, 30 files. Or maybe that's only my life, but that's what I hit. Um, and folks, I think, uh, this is the first time I've done the talk. I did it a little bit yesterday. Um, one last thing I wanted to throw out, since we're getting down a little early, um, this. So organizing your code. Um, I know one of the first questions people are going to ask is, well, how do you do your folders now? Do you do folders by features or wh whatever it's going to be? Um, I'm also going to say, um, talking about it with my, my colleagues at work, the still going down the approach, even doing feature folders by entities, by saying all the order operations are going to be here. I think because of the way things cross, entities cross in operations, You want to organize more on operations than you do on a static data-centric model view of your system. 
Um, that's more likely to get you code that's closely related together um, and enable to keep you from having files that become way too bloated. All right, folks, um, on that one, so I think you all been to, to NDC plenty of times. You know how we do, how they do the speaker evaluations. So today I was purposely trying to joust at, at some software architecture windmills, purposely trying to be provocative. This is for the first time ever. I was probably actually purposely trying to see if I can collect some red cards. Uh, at the end of this, hey, I'm done, I'm done speaking after this. Um, you want to come argue with me all day long, or, or please don't. Please don't do what Uncle Bob says. But um, I, I am down for it. I hope even if you, I didn't convince you to do anything differently. I hope at least gave you a little bit of understanding of the approaches you're already using. Maybe some some kind of look ahead of oh, here's some potential problems. We don't have it yet, but maybe we have it later. So y'all, you have been a great audience. Thanks for being patient with me coming in a little bit late. Thank you so much.